it. Yeah, you click got it. That All acknowledges right. that you know that I'm recording you and it's not a surprise. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Steve Hendricks. I was introduced to him by a previous guest on the show, Dr. Howie Jacobson, because he's wrote a fabulous new book called The Oldest Cure in the World, which deals with fasting. And he gives lots of props to two of my favorite people in the book, Dr. Alan Goldhammer and Doug Lyle. So we're going to find out from Steve, if when you eat and even when you don't could actually add years to your life, please welcome him to the show. It's so nice to meet you. Hey, great to be with you, AJ. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. You know, before we even get into all the science and this book is jam packed with science, let's just talk about why you're interested in this topic. Why did you write this book? Because it's not like the other books you've written, is my understanding. Right. I've, I've written two previous books, both about politics. The reason I got into this was because of my own health. Um, I came to fasting many years ago, about 15 years ago, because I was interested in, um, you know, what I could do to make myself healthier. I also was overweight and I wanted to uh, lose some weight, which I did. I've since come to think that fasting isn't the best tool for losing weight. Diet is a far better tool, but fasting could be an adjunct. It can be a, a help for it. Um, and uh, that was about 15 years ago. But what has what has happened in the time since uh, is that the the science of fasting has just blossomed in the most beautiful way in the last decade, uh, which gave me enough material to write a book. The book's a mix of the the current state of the science of fasting. It's a lot about the history of fasting and it's my own personal experiences with fasting Um, and with the growth of the science and sort of digging into the history and finding there was a lot there that was fascinating. And then having my own experiences with fasting. I thought, well, I think I finally have enough now after all these years of dabbling and fasting to maybe try writing a book about it. Well, that is, that's very cool because I love to know what made you decide to do that. It's very well researched. And I'm just so happy that your journey led you to True North, which, by the way, in your honor, I'm wearing my True North sweatshirt. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, I actually won this in a poker tournament with Dr. Goldhammer. You may not know this, but up until 2018, for about eight years, I worked there one month a year in December for a special right. program called the Holiday Extravaganza, which was actually based on what I know how to do, which was feeding. So I have very fond memories of the place and I actually don't live too far from there now. So fantastic. Yeah. True North features, as you know, in a couple of chapters in the book, I write about the experience that my wife and I had fasting there and the work, as many of your viewers already know, of Alan Goldhammer and the whole crew there at True North has been extremely important, both in the practice of getting people healthier, but also in laying some very important groundwork in the science and the study of fasting so that we can convince more people, more doctors who don't work at True North, that fasting is actually worth paying attention to. Yeah. You know, one of the things you mentioned about that, we at least know that for high blood pressure, it has reversed it in many people. Like that's a fact. It's in the scientific literature. You know, there's anecdotal evidence for other diseases, but we know it works for that. So, you know, it's like Dr. Greger has a saying something like, you know, if, 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 If the whole food plant-based diet has been proven to reverse coronary artery disease, shouldn't that be the default? Shouldn't that be the first thing? I'm not saying there's not a place for medications and surgeries and people have the right to choose whatever they want, but the fact that so few doctors know about it and the ones that do, they kind of like, they don't, you know what I'm saying? It just seems like it should be another tool in the tool belt of every physician. Yeah, it's astonishing. You know, that, that study that Goldhammer and T. Colin Campbell put out, the first showing that they could reverse high blood pressure in every single case of a person with high blood pressure who walked in the door at True North and fasted for an average of 10 days, every single case reversed high blood pressure was 20 years ago now that study was. And they have since done follow-up studies at True North that basically confirm what that study already showed. And it's not just that it reverses high blood pressure a little. It's the largest drop ever recorded for any therapy for high blood pressure, better than pills, better than conventional procedures. Um, And yet you're right, doctors do not know about it. And it's just because it's so, I think, extraordinarily counterintuitive. It is just hard for people to wrap their heads around the fact that when you don't eat, your body initiates repair mechanisms that can actually bring about healing. You know, 
it's understandable that we don't get that, right? Because when we don't eat for long enough, we feel like crap. We feel weak, we get grumpy, we, you know, gripe at our spouses or whatever. And yet here's, you know, someone like me or scientists or doctors like Goldhammer coming along and saying, well, I know you feel that way, but what's going on under the hood is some pretty incredible repair mechanisms at the cellular level. And it can reverse things like high blood pressure and a long list of others. But boy, it's hard enough, you know, convincing ordinary folks of that, convincing doctors whose first response is, well, if that's true. Why didn't I learn about that in medical school? Well, but they didn't even learn about nutrition. Exactly. It's the, it's the exact same story. They just simply aren't, you know, taught it, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. I have a bunch of questions for you, but I want to acknowledge a live viewer named Mark, who has just typed a really good question in the chat. Has Dr. Goldhammer said anything about your book? And if so, what are his thoughts? Um, I do not know if he said anything about my book. If he's if he has, he hasn't said it publicly. So I don't know. All the fasting doctors who I was aware of in the country got a book. My publisher sent them copies. So they they all have it. Uh, what they think about it, no idea. I mean, it's a thick book. It's only been out three months. It's possible they haven't even gotten around to reading it. These are busy people, but um, couldn't tell you what they think of it. Okay. Well, I'm, I I actually called him today to see what he thought, but I I didn't get him on the phone. So, but anyway, it's, it's a terrific book, like I said. And, you know, I was thinking, Steve, I have had so many family members that have, have cancer, that died of cancer or or just friends every day. It seems like somebody's diagnosed and they don't even want to think of this as an option. And like I said, you know, my understanding with cancer is if you have it in your body, it's been there a long time. And so if you decided to do something radical, like go to True North for two weeks, I don't think that's going to make a difference in most cancers, you know, life or death, but they don't even want to try it. Like I think of, you know, friends, parents, and no, no, you know, and it's fine to do the standard stuff. But my understanding from the work of Walter Longo is that if you fast first, all this conventional stuff takes better anyway, like it works better. Isn't that correct? Yeah, so where the real future with fasting for cancer lies is just in that, AJ. It's as an adjunct to traditional therapies like chemotherapy. Fasting weakens cancer cells. It does so through a few mechanisms. Cancers, most cancers preferred fuel is glucose. When you fast, it's not getting any glucose, so it's starved. Fasting also tamps down on the growth factors that uh, cancer hijacks in order to divide and spread and metastasize. And it also, fasting ramps up your immune response so that immune cells Um, that go around zapping cancer cells uh, are more energized and activated and do a better job. So it does weaken cancer, fasting does, but in almost all cases that we're aware of in human cancers, fasting is pretty crafty and it gets around all those hurdles, all right? And and what ends up happening is the, the cancer sort of weakens for a while and then it bounces back. We're only aware in humans of one type of cancer and that's follicular lymphoma. It attacks the lymph glands. Uh, We do have some case studies showing that it seems that fasting can completely eliminate um, uh, follicular lymphoma. However, for most cancers, what it's going to really be as a benefit for is just the work you referenced. Uh, And that is the work by Walter Longo, this professor at the University of Southern California, who has found that when you fast patients for two or three days, before they go on to before they go into a, a chemo treatment and keep them on the fast for another about roughly a day after the treatment, the cancer cells are weakened. At the same time, the healthy cells go into this protect and repair mode. So when you give the chemo, right, they aren't as damaged by the chemotherapy. To the extent that they are damaged because they're in this protect and repair mode that's induced by fasting, they will repair the damage that chemotherapy does more quickly. So people who have chemotherapy who do this fasting regimen, or in some cases a fasting mimicking diet, uh, will end up having far fewer side effects. They will have uh, less nausea, less vomiting, less diarrhea, less fatigue, fewer headaches, and so on. That we know for sure. Early trials have proven that. And what we're waiting to see in trials that are currently happening is whether because the cancer is weakened, the chemotherapy will be able to kill more of that cancer that's been weakened by the fast. And if so, could you even, because the the fasters are protected somewhat by the chemotherapy, could you even increase the amount of chemo that's being given so that you can kill even more of the cancer 
without killing the patients. It's, it's really exciting work. The, the research on it is extremely promising and there are trials going on in centers uh, all over North America and Europe. But yeah, convincing people to do that it's such a hard thing. Again, fasting is counterintuitive. You've got this cancer diagnosis. Your oncologist is telling you, don't lose weight, eat as much as you can, keep your weight on. And then you get this message that, well, actually maybe fasting a little bit during your chemo is good. It's very difficult for people to sort out, but maybe we will have the randomized controlled trial data in a few years that will you know, help people uh, see I, I, what I expect to be is see that uh, it will help with treatments for cancer. Well, that'll be the happiest day of Alan Goldhammer's life, <laughs> right? It'll, it'll be a good one. He's Absolutely. looking forward to that. If you just joined us, I am talking to Steve Hendricks, the author of the wonderful new book, The Oldest Cure in the World. So here's a question that actually I was going to ask a similar one from a live viewer named Cindy. She writes, when fasting reverses your high blood pressure and don't you, do you need to follow a low sodium whole food plant-based diet afterwards? Or otherwise won't it go up again? See, the bigger question I was going to ask from my experience at True North, I, cause you had mentioned that the weight loss is a, is a side effect of fasting, but that's not the best reason to fast. And I would see people, um, they would come every Christmas during that week and they would fast because they were heavier than the week before, but the other 51 weeks, they weren't doing anything health promoting whatsoever. Absolutely. Right. So Scientists have been dabbling in fasting for about, oh, 100 years or so, and they have known for that long that fasting lowers blood pressure, but they were sort of mystified. They kind of thought it was a, a, a parlor trick or something because it would lower the blood pressure. Then the people would go back to eating and the blood pressure would just go right back up. So they thought, well, this is useless. This isn't anything. What Goldhammer really did that was the true innovation was not so much to fast his high blood pressure patients, but after the fast to put them on an SOS free whole plant, you know, minimally processed vegan diet. And that kept the blood pressure down. Whatever they dropped to, uh, you know, there would be these follow-ups that would be done two months, six months, even a year later, the people who followed the diet kept their blood pressure down. It was just gone. But yes, if they go off the diet, if they're, you know, eating cheeseburgers or even, I suspect, oily hummus and, you know, salty crackers, probably it's going to go back up. And, you know, the further you get from the diet, the more it's going to go back up. So yeah, absolutely. And, and that's part of why it's the same thing is true of weight loss, as you're saying, AJ. You know, if, if, you, um, if you want to use a fast as a jumpstart to a healthier diet, absolutely. And Goldhammer talks a lot about this. People who are used to eating fatty, greasy, oily, salty, sugary diets are just not able to make a switch to plants. They, plants taste like crap to them, right? Those of us who have made the switch and been eating this way for a long time, plants taste great. They taste better than all that stuff used to taste, but no one will believe you. So if you want to use the fast as a jumpstart, sure. But if you're going to fast and you're not planning to follow it up with the healthier diet, get ready for your blood pressure to go back up, get ready for your weight to go back on. For that matter, whatever reverses during your fast. If your rheumatoid arthritis went away during your fast, it'll probably come back. If your you know, eczema went away during your fast or your psoriasis, it'll probably come back. So it is very important that you be ready to make the dietary change as well. Absolutely. And a lot, you know, Dr. Goldhammer would tell stories because ever since he was on the Rich Roll podcast, thanks to me, by the way, I'm his agent. You well know, done. <laughs> he's, he's booked six months in advance. And so he still does those intake calls on the phone, you know, to get to, to vet the people. And he says a lot of times you follow the diet and then they don't come because they got better. Yeah, absolutely. He, I tell one story in, in the book of a woman who had a uh, peripheral neuropathy. She was losing feeling and having, well, she was having pain as well in her legs. Um, and uh, she had, I don't remember what the exact number was, but she'd been to four or five specialists. She'd, she and her insurance company had got, put out $100,000 of tests and this, that, and the other. Uh, she calls Goldhammer to come in and fast. And he says, absolutely, we'll book you. We're booked four months out. But how about you change your diet in the meantime? And in the meantime, she does that. A week later, she calls him back, says, my neuropathy is gone. Why the hell did I go to all these doctors, spend all these thousands of dollars, and the one doctor I never even saw in person 
got got this, you know, got got me to make this change. And I had asked all those other doctors, is my diet possibly involved in this? Is, is there something about what I'm eating? And every single one of them had said, no, it's not the food. And the guy who said it's the food cures me without even seeing me. So yeah, not uncommon. Isn't that crazy? I know yeah. it's inspiring though, if people will do it. So another live viewer named Diana says, is there an age that you should not fast? I'm almost 70. Am I too old? So um, there doesn't seem to be an age past which fasting is a problem, provided your body can handle it. So, you know, if you're a healthy 70 year old, but a sick 40 year old, you're going to do great at healthy 70, but not so great if you're sick 40. Now, there, there are broadly speaking, two kinds of fasting. There's daily fasting, which scientists refer to as time-restricted eating. Some people know it as a form of intermittent fasting. And that's where you just narrow your eating window down to fewer hours each day so that your overnight fast is longer. And there are a lot of benefits to be had from that. Prolonged fasting, which is fasting for multiple days or weeks, sometimes even months, um, is, is uh, great at reversing diseases, whereas the daily fasting is usually better for preventing diseases. So both of those types of fasting can be safe for people of, of all ages. I mean, you know, not children, but let's, we're, let's assume we're just talking about adults here, okay? Um, so for adults, the real question is, you know, can your body handle it? And for prolonged fasts, you know, doctors are somewhat conflicted. Uh, in their advice as to whether you can do that on your own safely. Some doctors like Dr. Michael Clapper will say, you know, if you're in good health, you have no diagnoses, you're not taking any pills and so on. Uh, you don't suspect anything wrong with you. You can fast for up to seven days on water only at home, provided you drink enough water and get enough rest. Um, other doctors like Dr. Goldhammer say, ah, there are people out there with rare conditions. They're very few, but they, they do exist. Uh, and they could get in trouble on a fast, even a short fast. So you shouldn't fast for more than a day on your own. Um, as for, so, you know, that that's up to the, 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 the individual choice, but when in doubt, the short answer is fast under medical supervision. For the daily fasting, the scientists say virtually everyone can do that safely, provided you're getting enough calories. So that's, you know, narrowing your eating window. Most surveys show that people are eating 14, 15, even 16 hours a day, it's narrowing your eating window down to 12 or fewer hours a day, even as low as six hours a day. And the benefits uh, that we get in repairs to our cells increase with each hour that we shave off uh, our eating window. So you could, if you were in you know, good health and you can get all your calories into six or eight hours a day, you could do that and then fast the other 18 or 16 hours a day. That's great. Are you familiar with Dr. Esser? Uh, I know of him. I have not met him. Okay. Yeah. Cause you know, his, uh, he's in the history of fasting because his grandfather, who was also Dr. Esser, he's the fourth right. generation. They've been doing, he actually had a fasting place. I'm not sure when, but they've been doing it for a really long time, his family. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the younger Esser now, the fourth generation is uh, still has a I think what he what he bills is sort of a, a juice cleanse retreat in um, Florida, uh, where you can go and stay there, and they will provide you with you know uh, green smoothies or something like that for however long it is you want to stay. So, and there there are rumors that he's interested in sort of expanding into a water fasting place. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Yeah, well, he's a medical doctor; he could totally supervise it. Yeah. yeah. He's a very cool guy. He comes on the show quite a bit. He, um, okay, so Dahlia says, is this time-restricted eating, is it healthy to do every day? It is. In fact, it's best to do whatever your eating pattern is every day. See, part of the, the research into this shows that um, we benefit from eating in our circadian, in, in sync with our circadian rhythms. So if you are starting, you know, uh, to eat your breakfast at 8 a.m. one morning and it's 10 a.m. the next morning and 5 a.m. the next morning and whatever. Uh, and then you're finishing at 6 p.m. one day and midnight the next day and 9 p.m. the next day. Uh, your circadian rhythms apparently have a very hard time dealing with all that change. It's sort of like um, 
Sachin Panda, who's this researcher down at the Salk Institute in San Diego, who's done a lot of research on this, says it's like throwing your body into the equivalent of, of metabolic jet lag by shifting your eating patterns every day. So whatever you're eating is, it's best if it's consistent. And yes, it is uh, healthy to do it every day. And you know, bear in mind what we're talking about here is First of all, just returning at a minimum to the pattern that we probably, well, that we certainly ate, uh, ate at uh, for thousands, maybe you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years before electric lighting increased our eating windows. So, you know, probably we're not a hundred percent certain, but we can make a pretty good guess that early humans in Africa and their predecessor uh, hominids. Um, you know, would get up at, after sunrise, they would start eating sometime not long after that, and they would finish eating by sunset there in Africa, which would have been in the ballpark of 12 hours. The reason is, is that if you ate after dusk, if you went out looking for food, even if you stayed there, you know, with the fire and, you know, uh, eating your food and so on, uh, you were at risk of becoming prey. You were going to get picked off by nocturnal predators who had every advantage over us. Uh, over us. And so people who did that probably got weeded out of the gene pool. So we are, you know, descended from people who were eating during the daylight hours. So what we're, so when I say the scientists have, have concluded that uh, a 12 hour eating window which means we're fasting for 12 hours, is about where health starts. If you start eating 13, 14 hours or so, you're going to be less healthy. If you're eating in 12 hours, 11 hours, 10 hours, you're going to be more healthy. And the health increases, studies have shown, these are very new studies, just in the last five and 10 years, that, um, but they're very good. They're very thorough studies. They're very reliable. That every hour we shave off those 12 hours of our eating window down to about six hours, we get more and more repairs because the longer we're in our overnight fast, the more our cells will make some pretty impressive repairs. Yeah, this is, this is so cool. So Colleen, who's watching live, wants to know, well, how long can you fast if you're diabetic? Is it safe at any length of time? And we should probably tell people, what, what, at least when I'm saying fasting, I'm talking about if it's water-only fasting, to do it under medical supervision, not at home, especially yeah. if you're on medication or have a disease. I, I agree with the fasting doctors that if who you uniformly say, there's no disagreement here, if you have a diagnosis and you're talking about prolonged fast, a diagnosis of any kind, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, migraines, you name it. If you're doing a prolonged fast, multi-days, you want to do it under medical supervision, right? By a doctor who is trained, experienced in fasting and who can you know, help you with uh, getting off your medications because you typically have to get off your medications before you can go on to a prolonged fast uh, and dealing with whatever side effects and knowing, is this just, oh, I'm, my body's fasting and it's, I'm going to go through a few things that are uncomfortable or is this trouble and we need to stop the fast so you don't get hurt. As far as the daily fasting, uh, even people with medical conditions uh, can fast. Um, that includes diabetics, according to the scientists who I have interviewed. Now, there's one important caution. I'm very glad that you raised the point. If you are on medications, before you switch to a, a narrower eating window, you should talk with your doctor about it. That's because some medications during your fasting period could be more intense if you take them then than during your eating period when there's food in your stomach. So with a diabetic, for instance, if you are taking your insulin during the fasting period, if you're on a high dose, you could become hypoglycemic, too little blood sugar in, in, your, uh, in your veins, in your arteries, excuse me. Um, so, so for that reason, you want to talk to a doctor first, get the timing right. Um, but the scientists who I've interviewed all tell me once you get that timing right, uh, it's fine. There's no reason that a diabetic or you know, any other person um, with 99.9% you know, .9 of medical conditions or diseases out there can't safely fast. But we're talking about type two, right, Steve? Because my understanding is type ones should not fast. Well, I, I believe that if, um, well, I, I will repeat just what the scientists are telling me. And they're saying type one or type two, it would be okay to do the daily fasting regimen. Now, if you have some contrary advice from your doctor, you got to follow your doctor. Um, and these are not, you know, the scientists have, have worked with diabetics and pre-diabetics, and they tell me uh, that daily fasting is okay for type 1 diabetics, but you may have something else going on that's more specific, and you would need to pursue that further. But they say as a general rule, yeah, they think that type 1 diabetics can probably do daily fasting just fine. 
Nice. Thank you. Okay. So Janet uh, just finished a fax at, at uh, True North and she said that she has a friend. Where did it go? Come on, come on, come on. Uh, she had a friend who did a fast at True North, got all, all of his heart medication and still follows eating a whole food plant exclusive diet, but now does a three day fast every six weeks or so. And Cindy wants to know is timed interval eating such as 16, eight daily as effective as say a three to five day fast. It's, it's a very interesting question. So, uh, you know, the short answer is we don't know what the answer to that is. <laughs> we don't have the data to say. Here's what we can say. Um, if, if you're comparing it just to a three-day fast that you're doing every six months versus, you know, you're doing this 16-hour uh, uh, fasting every single day, I would bet my house that the 16-hour fasting every single day is far better for you than just the three-day fast every six months. Now, if you're comparing it to a three-week fast every six months or once a year or something, that's a whole nother kettle of uh, sharks there. And the reason I say that is because we do know um, that uh, you will get some repairs absolutely if you're doing a three-day fast, all right? Your body doesn't really get into just, you know, crazy overdrive. This is going to reverse my cardiovascular disease and uh, my arthritis and my fibromyalgia. Your body doesn't get into that in three days. All right. That's where you're getting into, you know, seven day fasts, 14 day fasts, even 20 or 40 day fasts under supervision again. All right. So, so, so better to be getting, you know, these, uh, these repairs that you're getting every single day than to say, eh, rather than getting these repairs every single day with the narrowed eating window, I'm just going to, you know, not do that daily fasting. And I'm going to instead um, do, um, do, do a three-day fast every six months. See, I mean, one thing to, to understand is, is that uh, daily fasting, it sounds strange or onerous to people, right? Because it's, it's a little weird. However, we're all doing it anyway, right? Every single one of us is fasting at night. You stop eating at nighttime. For most people, it's nighttime. And then you don't eat and you break your fast the next morning at breakfast or your first coffee or whatever it is, right? So what scientists have just done, it's a very... You know, it's, it's, it's a very simple thing, and it's a wonder that they didn't do this sooner. They simply started asking, well, look, does it make us healthier if, we, if that overnight fast is longer or shorter? And what they found is it's longer that makes us healthier. And, and let me tell you just a little bit more about the specifics of what they found. The kind of repairs that we're talking about on those overnight fasts are things like patching up our uh, damaged and miscopied DNA, which is extremely important. DNA is the uh, uh, instruction manual to everything that goes on in our body. So we get diseased when it gets damaged. It's things like increasing the antioxidants in our um, in, in our cells that will repair the oxidative damage from free radicals. Uh, it's things like increasing autophagy, which is the recycling of old and worn out organelles, these little vital parts inside our cells, and taking their constituent components when they're broken down during autophagy and sending them on to become healthy new cells, it's, or healthy new parts of cells. Uh, and it's increasing apoptosis, which is when you have a cell that's too far gone to be repaired, just killing off that cell, which sounds dreadful, right? But when you refeed after that, the sacrificed cells are replaced with healthy new cells. All of this stuff spares us disease. So our bodies are doing this all the time overnight, but what scientists are finding is we're not giving them enough time, right? They don't have a long enough fast to get it all done. And they think that is a piece. They're not 100% certain, but they're pretty, pretty, you know, uh, confident that that's a piece of why we're getting so much cancer, why we're getting so much atherosclerosis, dementia, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, and so on. So if you can get those repairs happening more and more and more every single night when you go to sleep, that's probably worth a whole lot more than just a three-day fast every six months. Well, it's so true what you said. Our ancestors did not eat at night. They would have gotten eaten. And also there was no refrigeration or 7-Eleven or, you know, 24-hour McDonald's or things like that. I mean, so a lot of people just, they eat all day. The minute they wake up, the minute they go to bed, and they wonder why they have reflux and can't sleep and all kinds of things. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, nice comment from Mark. He says, we loved your book. The section on intermittent fasting was particularly helpful. And I'm posting the link for the book, both in the chat and the show notes, if you want to check it out. Peter, who's watching live says, I usually eat between six and nine. I eat enough to maintain my BMI at 21, about 3000 calories. I feel satisfied. Any problems with such a short feeding window? I will tell you that they, they call that OMAD one meal a day. And I know that Dr. Goldhammer is not a fan of it, but I'm curious what you think, Steve. Yeah. So the data is not in on that, but I understand why Goldhammer has his concerns. Um, and the scientists who I have interviewed and doctors as well, like Goldhammer, their concern is, yeah, sure. You know, if you're only eating in three hours and you're fasting the other 21, um, then, um, yeah, you're increasing that time of repairs. However, their, their concern is, is that by, by cramming all our food into our, our stomachs and our uh, digestive tract in so short a window, what we might end up doing is causing so much stress to that digestive mechanism that we might counterbalance, we might outweigh whatever extra repairs we're getting in our narrower window. Having said all that, it hasn't been tested, um, to my knowledge anyway. The, 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 there have been some tests of four-hour windows. I haven't seen any down to three, but the, the four-hour windows haven't been great. The best uh, data we have is on six hour or longer windows. And those have all turned out to be perfectly healthy. We may find someday that a three hour window is healthy too, but uh, for, for the reasons I just stated, there are some concerns. Now, the, the one thing that I would uh, caution about the other thing that scientists have found, and this is just like in the last three, four years, if by six to nine, you mean 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., it turns out that's not actually the healthiest time to eat. It turns out that our bodies are hardwired to process nutrients most efficiently in the morning. Our circadian rhythms just demand it. So uh, our food, uh, when we eat in the morning, moves every, all the nutrients move very swiftly and efficiently to where they belong. That starts shutting down in the middle of the afternoon. And by the evening, we're frankly pretty terrible at processing food. And by night, we're just we're just horrible at it. Um, so if you're taking all of your food during the uh, during the nighttime, you're, what's going to happen is the nutrients from that food. First of all, it's going to be digested much more slowly. It's going to move much more slowly through the digestive tract. But the nutrients, as they go throughout your body, are going to linger in places where they shouldn't. The glucose from your meals, for instance. Uh, which needs to be moved efficiently out of our arteries and into the cells where it fuels, it powers the cells. Uh, our, our glucose will linger longer in our arteries, whereas any diabetic can tell you if it does that long enough, it's going to ding up the walls of the arteries and cause atherosclerosis and all kinds of uh, terrible conditions. So what scientists have found uh, is that actually the healthiest eating window is in the morning and to the, to the early afternoon. Uh, which sounds crazy, uh, eating from say 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. each day. It's what I do. Uh, I found it a very easy change to make and, and, I, and I love it. But I know a lot of people can't do that or don't want to do that. So for, for those people, there may be a compromise and that's simply to take most of your calories during that early window. So the science is very, very strong. But as it turns out, this old adage, which was created without any science, actually turns out to be true to eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a pauper, dinner like, excuse me, <laughs> breakfast like a king, lunch like a pauper, dinner, <laughs> breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, right. dinner like a pauper, <laughs> which in practice means bigger breakfast and lunch, just keep your dinner light and early. So uh, the, there are very good randomized control trials that show that um, eating in that sort of pattern uh, results in vastly more repairs, vastly less damage to the body. So for people who can do it, it's a, it's a great way to go. Yep. That, that, I, I thought that was an Adventist saying, or maybe it's just because so many of the Seventh-day Adventists live by that adage, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper, if at all. They call that supper sometimes in the Adventist community. And I live near Weimar. That's where my vegan medical doctor is, Dr. Neil Nedley, who heads it. And they have a live-in program kind of like the one that McDougal used to do. And they get two meals a day. The first one, I believe, is at seven. And the second one is at one. And they're done. Yeah. Uh, the phrase wasn't coined by an Adventist. It was coined by a nutritionist back in the 1950s. But it perfectly summarizes exactly what the Adventists have been doing it. And they, like me and other people, <laughs> me when I can say it, uh, have adopted it because, uh, you know, how, how much more succinct can you get? 
you know, I, I, I guess I intermittent fast, like I'm not doing it because of the research. It's just that I never enjoyed breakfast. I'm not hungry in the morning. That's exercise time. That's times I do other things. So I intermittent fast and I probably would say my first meal is 12 or 12 to one and my second meal is like five to six. I'm not doing it intentionally, but it's enough food for me. You know, I'm in my sixties, but I, I don't want to switch it up, Steve, because I am i don't like breakfast. I don't like, <laughs> I, and I try. So somebody said, that's because you eat so much at night. So I actually fasted as much as I hate to, you know, from a Sunday night, like at six o'clock when I woke up Tuesday, I still wasn't hungry. I just don't get hungry until 12 o'clock. Am I, I mean, am I doing myself a disservice or am I doing so much good that it's enough to just do 12 to six? It's so yes. easy to do 12 to six because dinner is the funnest meal. It's the only meal you get with friends and family. Nobody's coming over for breakfast. Yeah, it's 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 quite understandable. Again, you know, if you make your bigger meal, the lunch meal. Oh, always. Oh my God, lunch is my favorite meal. Like I yeah. just, I love lunch. It's so like, make dinner your your lighter and you know lesser meal. And you know, the, again, the scientists who I have interviewed and whose work I've read say, yeah, you are still absolutely going to get benefits. You would get more if you were able to shift that window earlier. But it doesn't mean you're going to get. You know, one way of perhaps interpreting it is okay. You're not perfect. <laughs> you're not hitting a home run, but you're still hitting a single or a double every day. That's pretty darn good. You're doing a lot of good for your body. So if that's the best that you can do, great. And you know, we still don't know. So, you know, I was like you, AJ. I skipped breakfast most of my life. I loved eating not just dinner, but these long, lingering dinners, you know, well into the night. I loved a, you know, a bedtime snack, the whole nine yards of it. And when I read this research for my book, it was just a couple of years ago, I thought, no freaking way am I ever doing this. Um, I tried it. It, for me, turned out to be the easiest big change I have ever made in my life. It was like my body was just waiting for the last 50 years for me to eat in sync with my circadian rhythms. It took only about, I'd say, three days before I just no longer missed dinner. And for the last two years, I've been eating in this pattern and I love it. And the reason I love it is my energy so uh, soared, my uh, sugar crashes went away, food cravings that I had had uh, went away for the first time in a long time. It was just very easy for me to manage my weight. It just stabilized, no problem. Uh, so, you know, there were a lot of benefits that I got. Now, I don't know that this would be true of everyone. I encourage people who are interested, experiment. Don't experiment for one day. Experiment for three or four days, maybe even as much as a week. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. Because we still don't have the data to say, I think it's possible that there may be some people out there like you who, for whatever reason, there may be something going on in their bodies, all right, where they are just not, you know, primed to eat in the morning. However, we know that for the, you know, the science anyway says for the vast majority of people, we are primed to eat in the morning, but we have trained ourselves not to. We get in a hurry. We do a whole bunch of other things, uh, you know, rushing out the door to get to work or whatever it is. And lunch is the first meal that we really just take a break and sit down and eat. And, you know, you should see, you know, you should see what you should see by experimenting. Maybe it is, is something just biological, physical to you, and it won't change. Maybe you'll find, as I did, that it, in my case, at least, it was a lot of, I would guess, sort of, you know, sociological training that led me to eat in this pattern. Uh, and I've been a much healthier person since making that change. I mean, that's interesting. And I really should do an experiment, but I honestly, I never ate breakfast. Even as a kid, I have, I have just caffeine and sugar until I was 43 Coke Slurpees. That's not breakfast. And so <laughs> I guess I, but I, I, I should try it someday. Um, and maybe I will, because I, how will I know if I don't try it? So the question from a live viewer, what do you think of fasting mimicking diet? I've never done it, but the one that Walter Longo sells doesn't seem like very healthy ingredients. It's very expensive. And to me, having a little food is, is harder than having no food. So for me personally, I agree. It's just easier to fast. Uh, it's cheaper, it's simpler, you know, why bother? But Longo came up with that diet for a very good reason for a whole bunch of other people who are not like me and like uh, like your, your uh, writer there who um, really are terrified by fasting or really find it very uncomfortable for whatever reasons. So for those people, I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, it's not a diet, it's basically a keto diet. It is a vegan keto diet. All right. So it's very high in fat. And the reason for that is, is that we have found that two of the most important uh, 
genetic pathways, metabolic pathways that are shut down in our bodies when we fast are a glucose or sugar processing pathway and a protein uh, processing pathway. When those two things are shut down, what happens is it signals the body to say, oh, we're not getting any food. Let's go into this protect and repair mode. We don't know why fat is excluded. No idea. Why does our body not care about fat? I'm not sure. Maybe it's because most of what we you know, ate previously in our evolution was you know, very heavy in carbohydrates and glucose and so on and protein. Who knows? But for whatever reason, you shut down those pathways, all right? Uh, and, and you can get these, these repairs. So Longo said, well, aha, uh -huh, I can give people some fat <laughs> and a little bit of carbohydrate and protein for four or five days. And it's a small amount. It depends exactly on what the fasting mimicking diet is, but let's say it's five or 600 calories a day. They will uh, feel better. They won't have some of the side effects that people have on water only fasting, like nausea or headaches or things like that. Uh, and, um, and they won't be as scared and doctors will be more willing to accept this as well. And if we do that, what we find is we get a lot of the same benefits of fasting. So I don't think there's any uh, support for staying on a keto, even a vegan keto diet for a long term. But the research is very, very good for doing it for a short four or five day period with these fasting mimicking diets. People have found uh, improvements in their cholesterol and triglycerides, improvements in their blood pressure. Diabetics have found improvements in their uh, 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 excuse me, in their, in their uh, blood sugar. Um, and all sorts of other people who have other illnesses have also benefited from it. So, so is, it, is it the answer? I don't think so. I think fasting is a better answer for people who really want to heal. But for people who are wary of fasting, sure, I think it's a great thing. Great. Thank you. Let's see. I have a nice comment. Uh, where did it go? I saw it. Okay. Oh, it's not a comment. Uh, it's not a question. It's a comment. Uh, it is a question. Sorry, I can't speak English anymore. Mark is asking, would drinking herbal tea in the morning cause your fast to be broken? So probably not. Uh, emphasis is on probably. The most common question I get is, is drinking coffee during your fasting period going to break your fast? And we know with coffee or other even zero calorie caffeinated beverages that caffeine disrupts a fast. It disrupts the fasting metabolism. The catch is scientists don't yet know exactly which aspects of fasting metabolism are disrupted by caffeine. So we just don't have any idea whether it's a big disruption or a small one. Now, we would assume that with herbal tea, which is basically non-caloric, that you're not running into any trouble. On the other hand, your body is processing whatever you're tasting, your body is going to have to process that, okay? So there might be a very tiny disruption, all right? But scientists think it's probably very small. The kind of rule of thumb that um, a lot of uh, researchers have concluded is anything more than five calories will disrupt the fasting mechanism. Five calories is one and a half grapes, it's like a teaspoon, maybe a teaspoon and a half of soy milk. Um, so, you know, herbal tea, that's probably, you know, half a calorie or something. You're probably just fine with it. If you have any doubts, though, you know, you can always just heat up your, your water and drink it hot. Um, but for, you know, if you're, if you're not, you know, if I were fasting to try to get rid of my fibromyalgia, I wouldn't drink anything but water because I don't want to take any chance whatsoever. If you're talking about just your daily fast and you want to have a little cup of herbal tea in the morning, go for it. I drink broth in the morning. It's called pot liquor. It's what's left over for, from steaming my husband's greens. I'm guessing that maybe has more than five calories. No idea, actually. That'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So uh, Apple would like to know, did you come across any research on the efficacy of fasting on mitochondrial dysfunction? There is no research that I am aware of uh, about that with one or two exceptions. <clears throat> and the exceptions would be mostly in mice. So I, um, most people fast for physical health. Uh, as I recount in the book, I had some mental health problems of uh, many years and uh, neurological problems, and I was shocked when those reversed on a fast and then stayed reversed when I switched to an SOS 
free whole plant diet. That led me to look into fasting for mental and psychiatric and neurological illnesses. And when I did that, I, I came across, I mean, it's, a, it's fascinating. I gave a chapter of the book to it. You can, in fact, reverse a lot of such things. But there is some research in uh, lab animals showing that when we fast, good changes happen in our brains, all right? And one of those changes that happens is the mitochondria inside our neurons seem to become healthier, okay? Now, that's about all we know. I mean, there may be more known out there by scientists that I'm not familiar with, but that was that's the only thing that's coming to mind that I ever came across about mitochondrial health. So we know mitochondria in the brain get better when we fast. And the mechanism seems to be that when we fast, we burn our fat, which is broken down into ketone bodies. And one of those ketone bodies causes uh, uh, an acceleration uh, in BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which helps make um, neurons, uh, the connections between neurons stronger. It creates new connections. Uh, I think it can even create new neurons. One of the other things that it can do is increase the health of the mitochondria in those neurons. So that seems to be the mechanism. Whether that would help with a more general mitochondrial dysfunction, we don't know. My guess likely to be the case because uh, because so many cellular repairs are happening when people fast. Uh, it would seem odd if repairs to uh, dysfunctional mitochondria were not also going on, but I'm not aware of any data to support that speculation. Interesting. Thank you. Elizabeth says, can you fast if you're skinny and need to gain weight? Well, it depends on what you mean by need to gain weight. If you are, so first of all, again, Anyone can do daily fasting, all right? It's just a matter of getting your calories in whatever window you set. So if you're eating in six hours, if you're eating in 12 hours or whatever, you need to get the right number of calories to maintain your weight. So that's true. That's true whether you're eating in a 12-hour window, a six-hour window, or an 18-hour window. Doesn't matter, okay? For prolonged fasting, they probably would not fast, you know, meaning doctors at fasting clinics who would supervise you, probably would not fast someone who is actually clinically underweight unless you had some, uh, some medical condition uh, that you were, you know, hoping to treat and the fast was short and you weren't that far underweight. So typically... Uh, underweight is defined as a body mass index of 18.5. You can go online and look at a BMI calculator to find out exactly what that is, but that's pretty thin. Um, most fasting doctors don't want to take their patients too far below that. If you're in great health, if you have some reason to go below that, they will certainly fast you below it. Um, but there has to be a reason. If you need to gain weight, then, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, these doctors who supervise fasting is saying, well, why don't we look at why you aren't uh, at the weight that you would like to be or that we think you need to be? Um, and uh, if there's some dysfunction behind that, why don't we address that first? Um, you know, if it's just a matter of you, you know, some of us process nutrients a little differently. Some people can't have, you know, they they eat three nuts and they put on weight. <laughs> Other people eat 30 nuts uh, and they're still underweight. So yeah. do, do a book on that. Okay. Because <laughs> right. people don't believe me. Literally, I will put on weight so fast, which is the smallest amount of tahini. I mean, I, and I worked with Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Lyle for three months after I lost my weight. Whereas my husband can eat like a pound and he he, he can't keep weight on. I would like to know the why. Yeah. I, I suspect you are a great processor. You know, you, you take that stuff and you take every, you know, calorie out of that and it's going into your body and I don't know, probably onto your hips and thighs and whatever else and your husband he doesn't, you know, it doesn't process the same way. He's not, he's not using every morsel of, of that nut. But, you know, if, if that's, if that's the case, then, you know, you need to find out sort of who you are and how it relates to your diet. I mean, it still needs to be a whole plant diet, but, you know, there are different, you know, versions within that. Um, and what they would probably want you to do if you're trying, if you're talking about a prolonged fast again, is get up to a more normal, more healthy weight. Uh, and then if you need to fast for something, then they'd fast you back down and get you to put the weight back on when they refeed you. Right. One, I, one of the, I love the story of Dr. Tanner in the book. <laughs> Yeah, Tanner was a kook. This, you know, 19th century um, eclectic doctor was what it was called. Eclectic doctoring is about like sort of naturopathy today. Um, and he is the father of modern fasting. And what he did was he was having all kinds of health problems. 
out in Minneapolis, and he fasted for 40 days out there, 41 days, in fact, and his problems went away and he actually got healthier and stronger, but no one believed him. They just, you know, said, you know, that's, that's insane. How can you claim that you did that? So three years later, an opportunity arose to fast for 40 days on a stage in New York City. He didn't have any diseases to, to heal at that time. But at the time, men of science thought you could not live without food for more than eight to 10 days. So the fact that he not only fasted beyond eight to 10 days, but did so in relatively good health became a sensation. It was huge. It was, it was bigger than the presidential race that year. It was reported on uh, in every single newspaper in the country. It was reported in newspapers in Europe and Asia and Africa. And that uh, uh, publicity that attended to his fast over the next, very slowly, but over the next decades, awakened interest in fasting that has become this modern era of this revival in interest in fasting that we are still benefiting from and enjoying today. You said something, I don't know if you said it in the book or I heard it on a podcast, but I loved it. I wrote it down that fasting is like a scalpel without the surgery. Yeah, the old fasting doctors in Germany used to call it that. And, um, you know, it really is. It sounds like an incredible claim. But the reason that they, they would say that, the reason it's true, is that when we fast, we don't get rid of all of our uh, body parts equally. You know, if you fast someone and they lose 10% of their, their weight, right? You, you would figure, well, I'm going to lose 10% of my brain, 10% of my heart, 10% of my fat, 10% of, you know, whatever, right? doesn't happen. You, you lose none of your brain, you lose none of your heart, uh, and you don't even just lose 10% of your fat, you lose first the most harmful fat, right? The visceral fat is lost at about a, I think, three to one rate. That's the fat that sort of uh, stifles and suffocates our internal organs. Um, and then the, the rest of our body fat is less harmful. You lose that at a slower rate. Similarly, you would expect you lose 10% of your weight. You're going to lose 10% of your, your cancer tumors in the case of follicular lymphoma, this cancer that I said could be um, could in fact seems to be reversed entirely, cured by uh, water fasting. But you don't lose 10% of your follicular lymphoma tumors. You, in some cases, lose 100%. So the body seems to have some idea about what is useless to it, or maybe even what is harmful to it. And during a fast, it's getting rid of those harmful things first. That's why it seems that fasting, for instance, can also uh, chip away or in some way reverse get rid of, you know, the plaques that are inside our arteries that cause atherosclerosis, that give us angina, that give us high blood pressure and things like that. It's those kinds of things that uh, led doctors to say that fasting was surgery without a scalpel. And I, I think they were entirely right. That's really cool. And, and when you talk about fasting in the book, you're talking about mostly water fasting or intermittent. You're not talking about dry fasting, right? No, dry fasting. I don't know any fasting doctors who are in favor of dry fasting, meaning fasting without water. Uh, you know, you're, you're, the, the one thing you really need to watch for on a prolonged fast is that you're staying hydrated. There are a couple of things you need to watch for, but that's one of them. It's one of the big ones. Um, and when you go without water, you know, there are fasting doctors in history who have done that and they have reported good results, but you are running some very high risks because during a fast, you're breaking down all this stuff. Well, your kidney, your liver, your kidneys and your liver need to process it. They can't process it very well without enough fluid going through there. So if you don't get enough water, your internal organs could be in a lot of danger and a lot of hurry. And as you know, I definitely wouldn't recommend you do it at home. And I'm not aware of a fasting doctor on this planet. I'm sure there is one somewhere, but I'm not aware of a single responsible one who, who would do that with patients. Right. Deb says lemon water. Will that take you out of the fast? Dr. Varesh, who I've had on the show who works at True North, says lemon water can take you out of the fast, in her opinion. Yeah. So again, you know, probably your lemon water is not going to, you know, whatever amount of lemon juice you're squeezing in there probably isn't going to exceed five calories. If it does, it's certainly going to break your fast. If it's below that, then it's a gray area. It's well, okay, it's it's not going to disrupt the fasting mechanism in a way that we can just tell, you know, you're no longer in ketosis, you're no longer this, that, or the other. Um, but if you're taking three calories worth of lemon juice, 
your body does have to digest it. When it's digesting that, it's taking uh, energy and effort away from the healing mechanisms of fasting that, that are the reason most people are fasting or many people anyway. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a gray area. I can, I can see um, fasting doctors like Dr. Goresh saying, yeah, we think it probably does. I'm not aware of science that convincingly says, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, you know, any little hint, the smallest hint of lemon is going to kick you out of it. But what I would say is if you want to be sure, and if you're doing a prolonged fast, if you're doing a seven day fast or something, a 10 day fast, 14 day fast, why take the chance, right? It's a lot of work. It's a, it's a bunch of effort. Um, you know, why mess with it? Right. Uh, what about exercising during the fast? I know Goldhammer frowns on that for sure. He wants them to complete rest. Yeah, very controversial. We don't have great data on that either. Goldhammer's rationale for having people not exercise is is I have people coming to this place to heal. Your body can't heal uh, if it is, you know, doing all this other stuff with, with your muscles and your mind. So I don't want people doing that. I think it is a, in the absence of data, I think it's a very safe assumption to make. On the other hand, I did report in, in the book this um fantastic uh, Russian psychiatrist who between the late 1940s and early 1990s fasted about 10,000 psychiatric patients, hardcore institutionalized schizophrenics and so on, and had a phenomenal track record uh, reversing their mental illnesses and getting them rehabilitated and back into uh, to normal life. One, of, one piece of his protocol was in addition to the fast, during the fast, I should say, was to have his patients exercising for up to three hours a day. <laughs> so, uh, and he never, you know, they, the, he, was, he was a good doctor from everything I could tell. And, you know, within the limits of the day, a, a good observer of science and so on. And they had, you know, all sorts of tests available to them. He never found any damage that was done to his patients either then during the fast or in the long run, because in the Soviet Union, you could follow up with mental patients for, I believe it was up to a decade, both at their home and at their work. So he had a lot of ability to see, like, is this hurting people over the long term? And he never saw anything. So those are the two opposite poles out there. You know, I, I, I will say this, when in doubt, err on the side of caution. <laughs> And, you know, so if I'm Goldhammer, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to do exactly what Goldhammer is, is doing if I'm a fasting doctor in the absence of data. On the other hand, if I'm, you know, a, a psychiatrist who's dealing with people who it's, I got to stick them, you know, in electroshocks or other barbaric treatments as happened at the day, or I've got this protocol that seems to work. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead in that case and exercise my patients. But for, for my own self, I will tell you, I don't exercise when I fast. Um, I'm fasting because I want to heal. Um, and so, well, I'll add one caveat to that on a water fast. Okay. There's another form of fasting that they do mostly in Germany and other parts of Europe called a modified fast, where they give you about 250 calories a day of mostly vegetable broths. And that keeps you in the fasting metabolism. And when you're getting that amount of uh, glucose uh, in your system, you can go out for a hike for an hour and a half each day. And that's totally safe. But on a water only fast, yeah, probably better err on the side of caution and minimize exercise. Yep. Thank you. Cindy says, what effect does an extended fast have on the microbiome? Yeah. So that's a really interesting question. In fact, Goldhammer at this moment is involved in a study, I believe he's doing with Luigi Fontana, who is this professor at the University of Sydney in Australia, one of the leading researchers in uh, calorie restriction and, and fasting and so on. Um, and so I say that because I expect soon we will have some pretty good answers. <laughs> Um, in, 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 for, for the moment, we don't have great answers, but we do have some information. And the bottom line is that when you fast, if you do a, I'm talking a multi-day prolonged fast now, eventually you wipe out the gut biome. You just wipe it all, almost all of it out. Um, your good bacteria, your bad bacteria, they all die. 
All right. So, um, you know, as a lot of your viewers probably know, AJ, the good bacteria feed on fiber. They really want plants. The bad bacteria, the ones that are causing all kinds of disease we're now learning, are the ones who are, you know, thriving on, uh, you know, cheese, meat, dairy, uh, highly refined, you know, sugars, high fructose corn syrup, those sorts of things. Okay. So you think, well, I'm fasting. I like that my bad bacteria are wiped out, but wiping out my good bacteria, isn't, isn't that a problem? Turns out it doesn't seem to be a problem at all. It's just great. What, what, you've, what you've got is basically an empty field, which after your fast, you can then reseed however you like. So it is extremely important after a prolonged fast, it's important all throughout life, but even more important after a prolonged fast to eat as exclusively SOS-free whole plant diet as you can in order to uh, reseed your healthy bacteria. Um, it's not to say, you know, fasting doctors often say you've completely eliminated your bad bacteria. If you refeed that way, your bad bacteria will be gone. They won't come back. Um, in fact, it is possible after a fast, you know, there are some, there are a few survivors in there, you know, 1% or something. Um, it is possible that those bad bacteria will come back, but they will be much less likely to thrive. They will be much less dominant, uh, if after the fast you, you feed them healthily. So it seems like fasting is an excellent way to reset the gut biome. And I will say from my own experience, uh, I had a period of gut dysbiosis, which I talk about in the book. Uh, and I went to True North and I fasted uh, and it improved. It did not go away. So I fasted on my own at home. I don't fast for longer than a week on my own. Uh, beyond that, I'm in a fasting clinic, but twice more for a week. The first time I did it, um, it did, you know, this is about six months after my nine day fast at True North. Um, uh, same thing, it improved. It did not go away. Six months later, same thing. I fasted for a week. The gut stuff improved, and that that time finally it stayed away. So so uh, so my gut dysbiosis completely cleared up. Uh, I'm assuming what happened was repeated fasts and healthy eating throughout um, eventually were enough to get rid of whatever was going on, going wrong in my gut. That's wonderful to hear. There's a question: if the visceral fat comes back when the fast ends. So no, that's another part. And if you go to um, True North's, so the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, you know, is a fasting clinic, but they also have a research arm, a foundation. And if you go to the foundation's webpage, you can find their studies on there. And uh, they've recently published, gosh, just in the last year, maybe their study on the visceral fat. And what they, what they found was not only the great news, as I said earlier, that if the prolonged fast will burn visceral fat at two or three times the rate of the more healthy fat, but when people refeed, they do not put back on visceral fat, certainly not if they're refeeding on a whole plant food diet. Okay. So what they were finding was, you know, that they've got the percentages on there. And I don't remember how much of what people were putting on was protein and how much of it was this or that or the other. But the good news, the bottom line is you weren't just getting that visceral fat back. Once you got rid of that, if you ate healthily, it stayed away. Nice. A couple of people are asking where the word fast comes from. It's actually on the True North website if people want to know historically. Yeah. So I, I believe if I remember right, it goes back to middle German <laughs> back when the, the, the Germanic word that meant fast and it was something like fasten or something like that um, uh, meant simply to observe, uh, to as observe in the sense of uh, observing a, uh, like a sacred ritual or something like that. So, um, so yeah, that came because fasting for the longest time, people, most people, 99% of people did not do it for health. They were doing it for spiritual reasons. They were doing it because they thought fasting made them holier and would get them to heaven sooner, or at least, you know, get them to heaven when the time came. Um, and so fasting in that sense meant to observe a rite. Right. On the True North Health Center uh, website, it says fast is derived from the Anglo-Saxon word feast, F-A-E-S-T, which means firm or fixed. The practice of going without food at certain times was called fasting. Yeah. So I think it evolved from the Germanic into that in the Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. I'm just curious, Steve, how 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 long did it take you to do the research for this book? And, and did you have to interview lots of people in addition to delving into the science yourself? 
Yeah, so I interviewed a fair number of people, but most of it was just like reading the research. So um, for the history sections, there were, uh, you know, a, not a large number, but a number of books and scholarly papers and so on that I read. And similarly with the, with the scientific sections, um, it was just reading, you know, mass upon mass of scientific papers, uh, most of which you end up not using, but that you need to read in order to kind of understand the lay of the land. And all in all, it took probably, oh gosh, I would say about two years of research to um, do the book and another year to write and edit it. That's a long time. It is a long time. And publishers don't want to give you that kind of time. No way. Wanted this book in nine months. <laughs> so, Tell me about it. Tell yeah. me about it. Hey, so here's the fun question where we get to know you a little bit. Every guest on Chef AJ Live, just about every guest gets asked this question. What does Steve eat in a day? And also, what do you do for exercise? If you yeah, so, um, so my day, almost every day starts with a large salad, which is a mix of greens that has arugula and kale and baby chard and spinach. And it's got, gosh, what, tomatoes and uh, mangoes, a little bit of avocado, some walnuts, uh, some broccoli sprouts, um, uh, and, you know, uh, whole grain, uh, unsalted croutons and a little bit of balsamic vinegar. And that's how I start the day. Um, did I say the berries, the raspberries, the blueberries, the blackberries? Because um, those are my favorite part. Um, and uh, then after that, I usually have an oat porridge, which is just, you know, rolled oats um, with a whole bunch of um, different spices, uh, ginger and cinnamon and turmeric and so on, uh, and a little bit of flaxseed and uh, chia seeds. Uh, and then after that, uh, there's usually a big vat of curry or a stew going on that will be made of, oh, potatoes or sweet potatoes. And we'll put that over, um, you know, brown rice or uh, wild rice or quinoa or amaranth or whatever sort of strikes our fancy. Um, and uh, dessert tends to be, you know, usually what you can make out of dates and nuts and oats. So a lot of like, you know, raspberry bars and uh, blondies and uh, things like that. So that tends to be what I eat during a day. Oh, and then lots of, you know, fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, you know, when I want a snack, I might just go grab a bag of broccoli out of the fridge and uh, throw it in the microwave and um, just eat plain broccoli because I love it. Um, I don't know, grapes, bananas, apples, those kinds of things. Wow. So for, for exercise, I am uh, lucky enough to live in Boulder, Colorado, um, which means we have mountains inside the, the, the city limits. So um, not today when there's four inches of snow on the ground, but uh, you know, most days my exercise is going for a hike in the mountains. Uh, and when I'm being lazier, it's just uh, walking my dog who, uh, who is part border collie and needs three walks a day. So I'm you know, <laughs> at a minimum walking two hours a day with her. And then if I'm being really good, uh, I'm going to squeeze in some yoga and some push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups and basic sort of calisthenic-y things like that. Well, when, when the viewers are saying, boy, this guy's going to live to 200, you know, if you want a <laughs> potato dog, they say get a greyhound, believe it or not. Yeah, so true, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? Well, you seem very healthy to me, and I'm sure Dr. Goldhammer will be very proud of you. I'd love to know what I tried to get his, you know, I'm, what he thought about the book, but he didn't answer his phone today, but I'm going to ask him and I'll let you know. He's All a pretty right. honest person. So what's next for you, Steve? Yeah, I don't know. I've been toying with another health book. I've been toying with going back to a political book. And uh, I've been doing a lot of through hiking. Like last, this past summer, I hiked a few hundred miles of the Continental Divide Trail, which runs along the top of the Rocky Mountains. And wondering if there's a hiking book in there. So that's a long way of saying, I have no freaking idea. <laughs> I got an idea. How about how to eat like us while hiking? Because that can be challenging for people. It is. And, and the short answer is I dehydrated. Every, I cooked for four months, <laughs> dehydrated. I brought all my own food. I didn't do any of that like trail, you know, crap that people are eating. It's astonishing that people can walk 20, 30 miles a day on, you know, junk food, basically. Wow. Uh, but, but they do it. But it's I fear for what their bodies, you know, will look like when they get off in, internally, you know, what their organs look like. Oh, boy. Do you have any social media presence? If people want to connect with you, what's the best place? Just send them to your website or 
Yeah, best way to go is through my website, which is just my name, stevehendricks.org. My email is on the contact page. And because, so the book, the book is a narrative. It's a chronicle. As I said, it's about the history of fasting, the science of fasting, and my own experiences. It's not your how-to fast book. You can get a lot of how-to from the book. However, if uh, people want more how-to than the book has, also on my uh, website, under the Frequently Asked Questions page, are a, a zillion questions, maybe 10,000 words of answers, some of which we've covered here, some of which we haven't, to the most common questions I get about, okay, thanks for this book, but how the hell do I fast? So um, that information is on there. People have found that useful. Nice. You know, I listen in, you you sent me the book a long time ago when I listened to it on Audible, which uh, great job. I love Audible books, don't you? They're fantastic. I do like audio books. They're great. Yeah. Because you can speed it up a little and it doesn't take as long. <laughs> so I listened to a bunch of podcasts in preparation for this interview. And, you know, like you had Dr. Howard Jacobson, a few other places, Mind Body Green, I believe. But then I was really like, what's he doing on this keto podcast? Because we're, I'm guessing that you're probably not a big fan of keto. No, it's not. So yeah, so I was on the Keto Camp podcast, <clears throat> uh, which was uh, something that my publicist had arranged for me. It wasn't one that I went out and pitched. But I thought, you know, I look, I'm happy to talk with anyone, even if they're not, you know, my people. Um, and it was actually quite interesting. Um, I do not advocate a keto diet. Um, the host tells me, I haven't listened to his podcast, but when we were just chatting, he said, look, we're not advocating that people stay on a keto diet for the long term. We're advocating that people do short term keto um, in, in sort of the way that you're talking about with fasting. You know, you, no one would want to fast forever, right? You're going to starve yourself to death. But as a short term thing that initiates these repair mechanisms. And I thought, well, as, as I talked about earlier, that's what Walter Longo is doing, right? This professor at USC who's got the fasting mimicking diet, which is essentially a keto diet, um, which actually turns out to be healthy for four or five days. So yeah, I, I, was, I was prepared, frankly, to have a fight. <laughs> I was prepared to explain, you know, why they were full of crap. And I was like, well, if that's all you're doing, you know, you're doing it for just a few days at a time, uh, then, you know, okay, there might be some benefit to that, depending upon how you're doing it. If you're doing it by eating a bunch of, you know, animal fat and cheese and, you know, whatever else, then forget it. It's that, you know, you're probably doing yourself as much harm as good. But, you know, I have no idea if that's in fact what's going on or if that's just what the host was telling me. But it was a very cordial interview. He was very open to my ideas and I, you know, was receptive and listened to each. I thought it was like a great dialogue which you don't often get, right? Between vegans and keto, animal keto people. Yeah. Uh, so it turned out to be better than I expected. You know, you, we touched on this at the beginning of the interview about, about how we don't recommend fasting, either just Dr. Goldhammer or strictly for weight loss. But this idea that Dr. Goldhammer is constantly studying a true north of taste neuroadaptation, that it makes it easier to adjust to the type of diet that, that we want people on long term. But I'm curious, did you do any research about the effect on fasting for people with eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia? Because I don't interview only vegans on this show, but mostly, but every now and then I'll have like someone who's a medical doctor or a PhD that, that is an expert in food addiction. And they say it's even Dr. Furman has said that certain people, it can be really devastating when they have these conditions, if they fast. Absolutely. If, if you, so certainly for prolonged fasting, all right, there, it's a little more gray with the daily fasting, but someone who has an eating disorder can be triggered by anything, even if it's otherwise healthy. I can tell you to eat kale, all right. If you eat kale, you're going to be healthier. If you've got an eating disorder, you, you may think, oh, my God, I'm, I'm he's put a restriction on me. He says I have to eat kale. Uh, if I don't eat kale, I'm a bad person. You know, and you go all the way down that line. So even healthy things to people who have eating disorders can be problems. But you're absolutely right, AJ. Fasting can be a real trigger for some people. So that's one reason why certainly for prolonged fasting, you know, it is not recommended if you have uh, anorexia or bulimia that you fast on your own. It could push you, you know, into a place you don't want to go. For daily fasting, some people with eating disorders can do it. Other people will be triggered by it. So it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. But again, err on the side of caution. If there's a possibility that narrowing your eating window is going to trigger your, you know, anorexia, don't do it, or at least work with a doctor work with a psychologist or psychiatrist as well if you need to, to figure out how to do it. 
Um, did I look at the research? I looked at a little bit. There's just not much on it. And the reason there's not much on it is because what, what fasting doctors have long said was, we will not touch, <laughs> we will not touch this with a 10-foot pole. If you've right. got anorexia or bulimia, we will not fast you. Now, on the other hand, one of the doctors who I kind of made a centerpiece of a little part of the book was this uh, lead researcher, one time head of Europe's most famous, largest, oldest fasting clinic, the Buchinger Wilhelmi Clinic in, um, in uh, Germany. And she, Francoise Wilhelmi de Toledo, used to be a bulimic herself. She became bulimic, bulimic at starting at like the age of 12 when her husband, uh, excuse me, not her husband, her father uh, said, I will give you a franc. She was Swiss, a Swiss, Swiss franc. I will give you a franc for every, I forget what it was, kilo or something that you lose. Uh, from that day on, she became bulimic. And what she told me was, when I first fasted, it was the first time I felt like I had uh, a normal relationship with my body. It was the first time I felt freed of any worrying about food. And she experienced it, this young woman with an eating disorder, as very liberatory for her eating disorder. And it helped her eventually overcome it. It wasn't enough alone. She needed some um, counseling and so on. But I say that because she said that she said she knows other people with eating disorders who've had that experience as well. So it's, you know, there's, there's a little bit of nuance there. We don't know the whole nine yards of when it might be helpful, when it might be harmful. If in doubt, again, first do no harm, uh, you know, well, that's why I think medical supervision, medical supervision is the way to go, because I've known people at True North that have lied about having these conditions or having them in the past and they fasted and it's just, it just not a great idea. Yeah. I was going to let you go, but then Lynn typed an interesting question. Are there certain foods or drinks that you shouldn't use to break a fast? Yeah, so you should break a fast. If you're, so we're talking, you know, if you're talking a daily fast where you're just fasting 18 hours, no, you whatever you know, normally eat in the morning. So again, plants are healthier. Similarly, you obviously want to break a fast on whole plants when you uh, break a prolonged fast, a multi-day fast. The longer it is, the more careful you need to be. And that uh, refeeding protocol is one reason in and of itself to do longer fasts under uh, a, a uh, under the supervision of a fasting doctor with some experience. But the, sh the short answer is you want to eat extremely gentle foods. So at True North, when you break a fast, they have different protocols depending upon, you know, whether you have a stomach condition or something. But but basically, they will break your fast on uh, um, some sort of um, very simple smoothie. So when my wife was there, for instance, uh, her first day of fasting uh, or feeding again, uh, she had just... Um, I believe the only two ingredients in her smoothie were watermelon and celery. And that was all she had the first day. Couldn't have been more than a couple hundred calories, maybe 300 at most. Um, and then uh, after that, she progressed to, I believe it was steamed squash. Um, and then beyond that, it may have been something also just extremely gentle. You can imagine the, the gentle things. There are things like, you know, a soft banana or, uh, you know, mashed not, not with anything in them, just plain, but like mashed potatoes or something like that. And then you work your way up to salad and then the typically harder to digest things for some people like, uh, you know, beans and, and, and other such foods, nuts and so on. So it's, it's a progression and the progression that you, you, how long that that progression takes will depend on how long you fasted. Typically you should refeed very gradually over a period that's about half the number of days that you fasted. You fast 10 days, you need to refeed five days. It may be a couple hundred calories the first day, 400 the next, 800 the next, 1200 the next, and so on. But, you know, it, it, it is often, the fasting doctor will often calibrate it very specifically to whatever condition you came in for. So I had this gut dysbiosis. I was on a completely different refeeding protocol from my wife. On the other hand, the same principle applied, very, very gentle, very, very easily digestible foods first. And your wife follows a similar eating style that you do? She does. She didn't at first. Uh, what's very interesting is, so what you talked about, AJ, about Goldhammer, talking about, you know, fasting in order to reset your taste buds, you know, the hardest things that they have found in their studies for people to get rid of are, salt. it's actually not the sugar, salt and fat. Those yeah. are the two big ones. If you just are you used to eating that, you switch to the diet that you and I are eating, it'll taste like crap. And most of the reason is salt and fat 
people people miss uh, you know the the amount of salt and fat that they had from their previous diet. So uh, my wife had this experience that Goldhammer has said I don't know how many thousands of patients have had. She's had sort of dabbled around the edges of my diet. Uh, that I had been doing, but she wasn't really enthusiastic about it. She went and fasted at True North, which was her first, you know, long fast uh, that she had ever done. After the fast, the stuff that I was eating all of a sudden tasted great. So yeah, for the last, I would say year and a half now, uh, you know, she has been on my diet and she used to be a, a junk food person. She would keep junk food in her drawer at work. And she had these moments, she had one where she, you know, was checking out at a Walgreens and, you know, the candy's right there in front of you. And she, you know, bought it uh, because that's what you do at a Walgreens counter. You buy the candy with your, you know, whatever else supposedly healthy you're buying, your medication, I guess. Uh, and, um, but she realized on the way home that it tasted good only in her memory. When she actually had to stop and think about it, she's like, wait a minute, I don't like the taste of this anymore. This is just habit. Uh, and so was able to throw that away. Uh, so uh, it was a real, you know, fasting Fasting worked for her exactly the way it has with so many of Goldhammer's patients and, and patients elsewhere, and that it's put her on a healthier path that she would have had a heck of a time getting on without the fast. That's nice. Well, watermelon and celery smoothie actually sounds good to me. I always think about how Dr. Goldhammer says, true north, where you make good food tastes not bad. <laughs> That's like, exactly right. right. Well, yeah. this has just been wonderful. I, I love, you know, your book is great. Links below. But I also love that you didn't just write about fasting. You actually fasted. So like, you know, I feel like you have even more authority on that subject because you didn't not just telling people what the history is. You did it. You had experience. Yeah, I think people like to read about other people's experiences. It's nice to read about what people were doing 2000 years ago or 20 years ago. But yeah, if you have the author sitting there saying, yeah, and on day 10 of the fast, I felt like crap and couldn't get out of bed. It's it's a lot more real, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, thanks. It's just been a pleasure getting to know you. You're very bright and articulate. And I, and I hope people will get your book. Thanks a million, AJ. It's been good fun. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. If you need a last minute Christmas present, my book is on sale on Amazon this week. So get a copy and please come back tomorrow when my guest is vegan in the burbs and they'll be doing some amazing recipes. Take care, everyone.